I was watching a, uh, a Fox television, about a 20 minute program on this revival. It was an excellent program and uh, just awesome. They were in here filming us and, and it was just, it was a great program that they did. And Fox Network has really treated the revival right. And, and, and they were interviewing, they interviewed a theological uh, president of a theological school. And, um, and he said, well, I don't really believe that all that, you know, and he started talking about emotion. And you just felt the dryness. And I love everybody, friend, but you felt the dryness. And then right after that, they interviewed a gang member. <laughs> and he said, he stood on that, and this went out all over the country, man. He goes, he goes, I was stealing. I was stealing your car, man. I was robbing people. I was shooting drugs. But I came to Brownsville, and Jesus set me free. Oh! Glory! This girl right here is a Methodist. For those of you that... This girl can out-jump any Pentecostal in this room. I, I promise you. Can you do that for me? Can you do a, a flip in the air? How many like to see her out-jump you? Come on, do that right now. Yeah. Well... I promise we'll calm down in just a minute. But I was, I was watching, I was looking around, and I saw a, 20, a one who was bound for 27 years in alcoholism going crazy here tonight. Just, it's been set free for six months. Teresa, I look over here. How long's it been now, Teresa? Two years. God set her free from drugs. Yeah. Dick, you said, you, can you jump backwards like that? <laughs> you, you're going to break your <laughs> You get out of here. How about you, sister? What's God delivered you from? Yeah. She was in gangs for four years. Drugs, alcoholism. Friend, what do you think... Just one more time, when I think, what would you rather have? What would you rather have, these folks out there, stealing from your house right now? You know, if you can't get excited, that's okay. But let everybody else get excited. Well, one more time. When I when think, I of, think his of his goodness and what he's done for me. When I think of his goodness and how he set me free, I want to dance. Jump up and down. Jump, 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 jump. All night, all night. When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me. When I think of his goodness, I want to shout. Shout, 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 shout. All night, all night. When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me. When I think of his goodness. I 
am dry and thirsty, Lord. Send your rain. Send your rain. Lord, I need your touch again. Send your rain. Send your rain. Let it rain. Let it pour from heaven, let it rain to revive our soul. I need your rain, I need your streams of refreshing till I thirst no thirst no more, Jesus. Lord, I need your cleansing now. Sing your rain. Sing your rain. Let this be your prayer right here. Please forgive my every sin. Sing your rain. Sing your rain. Come on, sing. Let it rain. Let it rain. Let it pour from heaven. Let it rain to revive our soul. I need your After you, Lord, we want everything you have for us, Jesus. To this dry and weary land, sing your rain, sing your rain. Lord, we need your touch again, sing. Lord, we need your touch again. no more, Lord. Send revival to our schools, Lord Jesus. Set the homosexuals free, Lord. 
Keep your hand upon this country and don't deliver us, Lord. Don't keep us for judgment, Lord. But set us free, Lord, and let your glory reign, Lord. Hallelujah. You came to us a man in very nature, God. Here's for our iniquities as you hung upon the cross. But God exalted you to the highest place and gave to you the right to bear the name above all names. That at the name of Jesus we shall bow. Every tongue confess that you are Lord. And when you come in glory for the world to see, we will see. Hail to the King. And all the day when the glory of the risen king will shine upon the earth then rival thrones will fall before the Lord of all hail supreme authority in the true and living God that at the name of Jesus we shall bow Every tongue confess that you are Lord. And when you come in glory for the world to see, we will see. Come on, lift your voice. Sing, hail the King.
sing the name of Jesus. 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 Risen and exalted one. Risen and exalted. the name of Jesus. No other name but Jesus. Jesus. Holy and anointed one. seconds and tell him you love him on Saturday night. Open your mouth from your belly. Would you praise him? Hallelujah. 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 That's it. One man with one voice. Jesus, we love you. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Fifteen more seconds, would you praise him? Jesus, we love you, we worship you. Mm. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Now one more time, would you give him a resounding round of applause? Clap your hands, oh you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Jesus, we worship you on Saturday evening. We worship you, we worship you, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you tonight. You may be seated. It's a mighty anointing in this place. We're so glad you're here tonight. How many is here for the very first time tonight? Let me see your hand. Amen. We welcome you. Give them a hand of appreciation and welcome. From across the nation and around the world, for over two years now, people have been coming here. And the reason they've been coming is because of the presence of God that's in this place. The glory of the Lord is still the greatest drawing card there is. Jesus said, if you lift me up, he said, I will draw all men unto me. The evangelist, the pastor, the team, over two years have guarded this revival. It's not about personality, denomination, finances. It's about something greater. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, my heroes have never been Magic J or Michael J or OJ or Dr. J, but I love the mighty J. How many love Jesus? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so we're here to exalt him and worship him. As we move into this service tonight, I want you to open your heart and obey God as we receive the offering. And uh, the needs are great, but God knows the needs. And I'm going to ask you to participate and simply obey the Lord. Obedience is better than anything in this world. Obedience is better than sacrifice, the Bible says. I wrote a poem some years ago that goes something like this. Blessed with the best or cursed with the worst. The choice is yours today. The difference is whether you put God first, he blesses those who obey. Daniel obeyed to the king's dismay and sought the God of his love. He was invited to be on the menu one day at the local Lions Club. So into the den of big hungry lions, poor prey and Daniel was thrown. But those roaring beasts couldn't eat this tough man because Daniel was all backbone. You'll burn the fire, the king did say, but the three holy Hebrews obeyed God anyway. The furnace was heated hotter, the fire it did churn, but the three Hebrew boys would not bend, bow, or burn. So the moral of the poem to the young and the old, don't ask God questions, do what you're told. When God says go east, don't head for the west, or you like Jonah will get in a whale of a mess. Now, ladies, go ahead, I'll wait. <laughs> it went to print. And um, this is heavy. And uh, one, of the, one of the problems people have with Mike, people try to stay away from him. Because he's right. And um, that's why when he has debates with rabbis, and he, win he wins. And uh, so people aren't calling up to have debates. People run. And uh, a lot of the folks that criticize revival will not, will not sit down one-on-one -on -one with Mike because they know, especially in front of, with a microphone in a crowd, they just won't do it because they know it's too powerful. It's too strong. Scripturally, he's too strong. And so um, I just want you to let you know what's behind in, in these, between these covers is something that's going to shake a lot of folks that call themselves theologians. They call themselves revivalists. They, the, they call themselves protectors of God's church. They're going to be shocked when they read this, and a lot of them are going to be scared to death. And I, this this book right here needs to be on, it needs to be out there. Uh, I wish this was at, out back when Charles Finney was preaching. I wish this was out back in, when John Wesley and George Whitfield were preaching, because they're going through the same thing every one of us are that where revivals going on. Now revivals spreading. Period. I mean, just nothing's going to stop a move of God. But it's wonderful to have a scholarly work. A scholarly work. It's one, it's one thing to have opinions. Everybody's got opinions. It's another thing to have a scholarly work that says, hey, here it is in the Word. Here it is in church history. Here it is. These are the facts. These are the changed lives. This is what's happening. And uh, I'm so thankful this thing is out. Glory. I want to just share something that we pull off the Internet today. Chaplain Robertson pull this off. Uh, we don't really know where it's from, but it's, of course, from the Internet. And it says, I've been deloading your sermons from your site there at Brownsville Assembly. I started because I had heard you were a cult. 
and I wanted to prove it to myself, and I ask your forgiveness for the things I've said about your church without any knowledge. Your sermons tell it all. If other churches preach the word like you do there, it would be revival all over the world, and the Lord would come back. <laughs> And it said the Lord would uh, come back for his church. But please, please add more sermons to the list for those of us that are unable to attend a true church. God bless. And he gives his name. You know, I've often said this, friend, if I'm going to err, I'd rather err on the side of the Holy Spirit than against the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, every night whenever people come in here to this revival, like tonight, there's very few of our Brownsville people. How many of you here tonight from Brownsville Assembly? Can I hold your hand up. See, there's, there's probably about um, 5% that are here tonight from Brownsville. Now, tomorrow, Brownsville will be here in mass. But any night that you, that you just take a service, Wednesday through Saturday, uh, you're not seeing Brownsville Assembly here. You're seeing people from all over the world come, and they're coming to this revival. And it's impossible to police everything that happens with people coming like this from all over the world. You can't control every little situation, and we're not going to try to control every situation. But we are providing a forum here for God to do what he wants to do and for God to say what he wants to say. And we're letting God touch who he wants to touch. And I tell you, when somebody's demon-possessed and they're bound by all kind of addictions and bound by all kind of darkness, when God touches them, there's going to be a reaction. And if religious people looks in and sees that, they want to criticize us, I say that's fine. I don't mind that at all. Because wherever Jesus went, he did the same thing, and they even said he had a devil. So we're used to it by now, friends, and we're just going to go on and push on, let the dogs bark, the caravan moves on. We're going to, uh, we're going to dedicate this book and bless it. I want you to extend your right hand this way. Yes, now, Father, we believe that you have called Mike Brown and have set him in the body and in the kingdom for such a time as this. Lord, you have given him the intellect that he has, but you've also blessed him with the tender spirit that he has. And Lord, we thank you for defenders of the faith down through the years. And in these years, we are not without a defender of the faith. And Father, we find that here in this revival in Mike Brown. So Lord, we bless him, and we know that this book is going to draw tremendous fire. It's going to draw a lot of fiery darts from the deepest pits of hell. It's going to rowel the Pharisees, and they were the very ones that killed you, Jesus. But I pray for Mike. I pray that the Spirit of the Holy God will galvanize him and protect him and Lord cover him in the blood of Christ make him impervious to all the fiery darts of the devil and Father I pray that this book that you have inspired and you have anointed for this hour and this time and this revival that Lord people that would pick it up that maybe had serious questions or even thought that what was going on in these days is cultish that there would be such an anointing on this book that it would turn many from cynicism and criticism and pessimism and turn them to the most holy faith of the living God. And Father, I also pray that this, blessed be, that this book be blessed and that it be catapulted to the highest ranks in the Christian bookstores. And Lord, even some bookstores that are only carrying books that fight revival let this book gain such favor and such credibility that you will raise it up and put it on the head shelf and in the windows of those bookstores and let even them have a turn and a change of heart. And Lord, don't let the pessimists and the Pharisees turn America against revival, but oh God, let revival break out all over this world. Woo! Father, bless this book. Lord, we speak that in the markets of the world that this book would sell and do, and do great and that it have the favor of the nations. Father, let it be a bestseller, not only in Christian markets, but also in secular. And Lord, when people read this book, let their heart begin to burn to know more about a living God in these days. 
in Jesus' name. Father, bless Brother Mike's ministry. Bless this book to bring into his ministry coffers much needed funds to help him do a work around the world. You see his heart for India. You see his heart for other third world countries. Jesus, you've raised him up. And let this book be one of those catalysts that you use to bring in much needed funds to help him reach this world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Testimonies work. Everybody stand, please. <laughs> How y'all doing tonight? How's everybody in the chapel? It's great to see you tonight. We love you. I tell you, every night when we walk out here on the stage and we see the people out there that have been standing in line and you've come and you've been in the church now for about an hour and you're, there's great anticipation. You don't know how it ignites our heart to walk in here night after night. Many times we're so tired we can't hardly put one foot in front of the other one. But when we walk out here and see you and see your hunger and your desire for God, it just ignites us night after night. And I just wanted to tell you tonight how much we all love you in this church. We pray for you, and every night as we come and we see your faces, you show up maybe two, three nights in a row. We get used to seeing you there. And next week when we come back on Wednesday night, there'll be another crowd here. They'll be here for three or four or five nights. But we get used to seeing you, and there's a fixation in our minds of your faces. And down through the years of this revival, there's fixations that I have in my mind of people as they have been going after God and hungry after God. I've never seen such a generation so hungry after God as this generation is. And I just wanted to tell you that your hunger so blesses and touches our hearts. We love you. And may God bless you. If it was possible, I'd go around tonight and kiss every one of you on the forehead. <laughs> now, what we want to do is we want to take about four or five quick testimonies. But before we do that, I want to just go ahead and tell you that. So if you're here and you have a powerful testimony where God has touched your life in this revival, maybe this is the third or fourth time you're back, and maybe the first time you came you were mightily touched, or maybe you're here and you're a pastor and you're, your church has been mightily ignited because of the revival. We want all the testimonies revival related. I'm going to choose about five. Now, there'll be a lot of hands go up, but I'm just going to choose about five people at random that we'll call up here to give a testimony. We're going to do that in just a moment. But first, I want to ask you, how many of you here tonight for the very first time? Let me see your hands. Very first time. All right, how many of you, this was your first week at revival? Can I see your hand? First week at revival. Let me ask you this. How many of you are from the south? How many of you are from the north? The east, the west. How many of you are from outside the United States? How many of you are non Pentecostal? Non Pentecostal. Wow, that's wonderful. How many of you are Pentecostal or charismatic? Let me see your hands. God bless you. How many of you, let me just ask this question tonight. How many of you uh, got saved this week or you are in backslidden condition? You've just come back to God. Let me see your hands. You've just come back to God this week. God bless you. Hallelujah. Now, what I want everybody to do while you're thinking about your testimony, I want to take about two or three minutes. Nobody leave the building because we're going to move going quickly. Brother Steve is going to come in just a minute and preach. We're going to try to go through here as quickly as we can. Everybody needs to be out tonight by 1030 because we have to have the custodians come in at 1030 and they'll be cleaning all night, getting the church ready for church tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. So that's why on Saturday nights we start at 6 o'clock and we try to be out by, 10, by 1030 and at the latest 11. So that's why on Saturday nights we try to, uh, you know, go as briefly as we possibly can. But we want to hear five powerful testimonies. If your testimony is powerful and relevant and up-to-date in regard to this revival, we'll ask you for it in just a moment. But first, we want everybody to turn around and to greet four or five, six, seven people near you, introduce yourself, and welcome them to revival. Yes, sir, back there on the, the pew sitting down. Come on up here, son. You want to testify? Which one? Yeah, come on. All right, that's it. Well, son, I got to hear this. Uh, well, well, Everybody uh, was pointing at you up there. Uh, thank you. To uh, come up here and give you testimony. Where are you from, man? Mobile, Alabama. Mobile, Alabama. Yes, indeed. 
What's your testimony? Well, um, I love God. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I've been wanting to come up here and tell my testimony for a long time, but I couldn't because I didn't know why. But I know now because I didn't give myself a hundred percent to God until last Saturday night at this revival, and I mean that's why I couldn't. But He delivered me from drugs, gangs. Yep from just trying to fit in with everyone else and he said he said the Lord delivered him from fitting in with everybody else God did a good job God did a good job Uh, but, um, I mean, I kept going back and going back away from God, and he kept blessing me, and I kept accepting it and turning around and kicking him in the face. And I just want to tell all of you, I mean, no one's perfect. Everyone is a sinner, and everyone, every night that comes here should be up here at this altar. If not for yourself, you should be praying up here for someone else that you know or people that you don't even know to come to the Lord. They need it, and they're not going to get it unless we pray. When did you get saved? I got saved about, goodness, um, <laughs> About nine months ago. I didn't start living it until about four months ago. So in other words, nine months ago you made you made a decision you made a decision for the Lord, but it took a while for you to really kick in where you're gonna sell out and serve it. Yes indeed. And so you were in gangs, you were in drugs, alcohol and all that. Well son, let me tell you something. You know, people may look up here and they may think, I don't know. But you know what? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. To come from drugs and alcohol and gangs, you come a long way, baby. Come a long way. We're proud of you, man. I like the suit. I like the suit. Shoes have got to go and the sunglasses have got to go, but I like the suit. <laughs> I like it, man. Uh, come here. How you doing? What's your name? Tasha. Tasha. And how old are you? I'm 15. 15. And where do you live? Here. <laughs> in school? Okay. What's your testimony? Um, I was in a gang for a long time, and I, I was being disobedient to my mother, and I was, I was fighting everybody and was just, I, I was doing drugs and everything, and just, it was just making my life miserable, and then I just came here with my friends, and then at first I was just thinking that I'm not going to be, I ain't going to be a Christian, and then I was, I was just being... What did you think Christians were? What, what did you think Christianity was? I just, I, I, I didn't want to be good, and I, I, I didn't, I was like, I don't want to hang out with them, they're, they're not good, and I, I was just being bad, and I, I wasn't realizing what, what I was doing until then I came down to the altar, and then I just finally gave my heart to God, and then I asked Him to forgive me, and, and then I just... What happened to the gangs? Um, I dropped it all, and I'm not hanging out with them no more, and, and, and I quit the drugs. What does your folks think about you dropping all that and coming to church now? Well, my mom's a Baptist, and she don't really like this church, but she's great that, she, she's just, she's just great that I'm not, uh, I used to hit on my mom and everything, but she's just great that I don't hit on her no more and that I, I just quit everything. God bless you, baby. We're glad you're here. Let me tell you something. If the devil makes a move on you to try to pull you back and to get you out of church, whatever he tries to do to you, he's, he's vicious. You fight against him and you stay in church. That's your lifeline. That's your lifeline, and the devil knows if he can get you back out there in the world, it'll just be worse and worse and worse. So whatever you do, sweetheart, you stay with God and stay in church, okay?
We love you. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. What's your name? Bill Drahan. Bill? What's your last name? Drahan. Drahan. Yes, sir. And where are you from? Uh, North Carolina. North Carolina. Yes, sir. What's your testimony? Well, I'm an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God, and um, we evangelized for two years, and then we pioneered a church for five, and we just resigned. And during that, those seven years of ministry, we've traveled throughout the United States, uh, my wife and I, and uh, had grown really discouraged. Um, what did you grow discouraged about? Come on over. Well, what was you discouraged about? Because our heart was revival, and what was you seeing in churches? Either the pastor wanted a revival and the people didn't, or either the people did and the pastor didn't. And uh, m many times we were never invited back. Sometimes we didn't even receive our uh, offering that was taken up, and uh, we were. So if you preached holiness and preached revival, they wouldn't even pay you. No, sir. No, sir. Left for the fellowship. It was incredible. It broke our heart. And what was you preaching? Some of us, I mean, identical. I turned to my wife all during the week. I said, you know, I said that. You know, I hear in the evangelist hill. I said, people clap and get excited. And uh, whenever I would preach something like that, they, you know, make a fight. But you know what the difference is, though? The preacher here wants revival and the people wants revival. Yes, That's the difference. That's the difference. You see, if the preacher, if the preacher and the people can ever get together, revival will break out. Yes, sir. And I feel sorry for preachers that want revival and the people don't. And I feel sorry for the people that want revival and preachers don't. Yes, sir. But if they can ever get together, Lord, have mercy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's so true. And, and you were compelled, I know, by the Lord to pray for my wife and I because we were so discouraged and so beaten down. And, and the Lord just really encouraged us, strengthened us. We have an opportunity to uh, be the youth director for the North Carolina District next month. And, we hunger for the young people to experience revival. We've done national youth camps all across America. We've seen young people just as you have here and the people all around you know, this great auditorium. We've seen the hundred young people. And the Lord confirmed in our hearts when you prayed for us. We were, the power of God hit us and God reaffirmed in our heart that revival is coming. Just keep on keeping on. Amen. You know what? Father, I pray for this evangelist and his wife that every dollar and every offering that's been withheld from them for doing right and preaching holiness, that, Lord, you would triple it back to him through unexpected sources. Let him not have a lack. But, Father, with such a hunger today in the land and with him having a passion for revival, Send him where he needs to be sent. Yes. And let it be a divine kiss of your glory and your power. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God Amen. bless you. Can I say how much I love you and appreciate you? Steve, I love you. Appreciate you. Uh, Dr. Brown, I love your books. I have just about every one of them. And my favorite one is The Charismatic Church, Flame the Spirit or Down for the Count. And I just wanted to express my appreciation as a minister. Keep preaching the gospel. We love you. I love you, Pastor. Hi. What's your name? My name is Lynette Harville. And what's your testimony? Well, um, where are you from? I'm from uh, Lake Jackson, Texas. That's below Houston on the coast. And um, a year ago, Father's Day weekend, I came here before then, a few weeks before that, my pastor came and his wife, and they came back, and they were so changed. Um, that I just knew, my girlfriend and I knew we had to come. I had grown up in the church all my life. And I worked in it. I married the youth director, and I was the children's director, and he left me for a younger woman. And um, I have two children, and I got mad at God. I was so mad. Yet the whole time I knew God was holding me, I felt like a little rebellious two-year-old mad because I couldn't go run out in the streets, and he was holding me, and he wasn't mad at me, but I was so mad at him because, see, I understood religion. And I, and I thought I had played the game right and done all the rules right. And, and I felt like he had let down on his end of the bargain. And I was so hurt, so very hurt. And I gave up the children's ministry. And I, we were just really starting to go out and evangelize and, and do uh, crusades and so forth. And I gave up that. And, and so I just knew I had to, I had to find 
my answer, my healing. And so I came and we walked in the door and it was, it was, we were late because we didn't know you had to stand online. And we were sitting in the back and I think somebody told me it was the first night y'all decided to open up the chairs here. And y'all opened up three rows and they said, you can go sit in the front. Well, I was too scared to sit in the front row. So I sat in the second row, the third one in. And I noticed all the teenagers just worshiping God and praising God before the service. And that blessed my heart. And I was kind of looking around and these two young men came sat next to me and they were shaking and I was like going what is going on here I'm simply a god but you know I hadn't seen that and so so then so then they had us hold hands and pray and this hand you know was going like this with this boy over here and then the praise and worship Lyndall began and and we only sang a couple of songs and then uh Steve, he grabbed the microphone, which I didn't know any of you guys. He grabbed the microphone, and he went over here to the youth, and he goes, he started shouting. He was standing right over there in front of that monitor, and he goes, now, now, now. And when they did, they went just like dominoes. And, and Steve was standing there, and all of a sudden, he sh- started shaking like he was convulsing. And I'm a nurse, and so I was playing nurse. And, and so... <laughs> and so, so I was like... Oh, God, is that you, or is he having like an epileptic convulsion? Do I need to play nurse here? That is, that is all I remember, except one other thing. I remember feeling a gust of wind, and my, I remember thinking, my feet are leaving the ground. Honey, I got so close to almost a rapture. I mean, I mean, it went, that's the next thing I remember is my feet are leaving the ground. And then I, I woke up, I was over here. I flew, I flew over here. When I came around, y'all were back to singing and everything, and I came around, and I thought, I have driven all the way from Houston. I got off work at 6 o'clock on Friday. We drove straight through. I slept a few hours and came and got, came in here, and I said, you know, I've, been, I've driven too far to miss the service. God, I want to get up, and he wouldn't let me get up. You know, I was down. And so, but after a while, I did get up and, and join the rest of the service, but what happened? You know, he puts us down there, I think, so because we don't stay down long enough on our own. So he kind of he needs to complete his work. So he puts us down there. So if you can't get up, don't worry about it. Let him take care of it. And so, anyway, when I came up, it was all gone. The master surgeon, he healed. He, no scars left. All gone. All gone. All the way home, my girlfriend and I, it felt like just maybe two hours. We talked, we talked, we, we, you know, she got touched too, and we talked, and we listened to the music, and we bought the CDs and stuff, and, and, and the Lord told me, and I started hearing the Lord, the Lord told me that he was going to make me an intercessor. And I didn't, you know, my grandmother was an intercessor, my aunt was an intercessor, but I didn't really even, I didn't want to be one. And, and, and he told me. Why? Because they pray and they cry and they do all those things. And I saw my grandmother doing that. My, my grandmother had 14 children. And, and she lived in New York City. And she'd open up those windows in the whole neighborhood here to pray for every, grand, every child and every grandchild. Every one of them. Every day. And she's got a lot of ministers out of that. If you had 14 kids, you'd have to be an intercessor. <laughs> I guess so. But anyway... The Lord told me that, and, and He has. He has placed it, that on me to where I just love to pray now. I love it. I've got an hour commute back and forth to work every day, and I have time with God every day. And I just love it. I love to pray. I love... Well, what would you say to a critic of revival? What would you say to them? Don't knock it <laughs> until you've tried it. <laughs> So you're telling me that before you came here, you was in the ministry, and you were assemblies of God, but you never saw any of the things that's attributed really to Pentecost. You never saw any of that. I just heard about it. I just heard about it. And so now that it started happening, and, and then this wind gushed through there, and you were on the floor, and God touched you. That's the normal Christian life, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Now, now I know. <laughs> now I know. And the Lord has just opened up the door. That now the children that I was a children's minister to, now I'm the youth director to. Yes, they just opened up that door. 
And I just, I feel like that's such a unique blessing because the seeds that I sowed, now I get to, we, oh, I've got a five in Mexico now on a mission trip. I just had seven come back from intensive month training in Warriors. When we're going to go to Montrose, which uh, uh, is a city in, in Houston. And we're going to, yeah, and the riot center, they're, they're, we're going we're gonna to work together. And we're going to go out and we're going we're gonna to change Houston area. <laughs> Uh, what's your name? My name is Monica Evie. I'm from... Where are you from? Omaha, Nebraska, Trinity Church. Omaha, Nebraska. And who's your pastor? Our senior pastor is Pastor Les Beecham. And he was here in February, and y'all prayed for him. And uh, shh, revival's coming to Omaha, Nebraska. It is. It's coming. Well, what's your testimony? What happened? Well, how it happened was that when they came, uh, it, God laid on my senior pastor's heart that he was to come to the revival. And so he gathered a couple of other uh, pastors and a couple of elders, and they came down. And before they came down, in the intercessory prayer meeting, there was a prophecy over Omaha and a vision that was seen that was an eagle's claw gripping the middle of the nation. It was very extensive, so I won't go into it. But that happened before they got here. When they got here, they got into the intercessory prayer meeting, and the heavens just broke loose. And there was celebration and dancing and my pastor my pastor came back changed absolutely changed so he came back and brought back all the pastors and all the elders and their wives all here and they've all come back changed and it's just been amazing so my as we we've seen my my senior pastor came back and he was so under the conviction of the holy spirit of the sin in his life when he was here he was un undone and when he got back here sorry <laughs> oh when he got back when he came back home he laid out his life to the congregation and we have a big church and it's hard to do that to be vulnerable what did he do he just confessed i don't know maybe 21 sins before the whole congregation and wept and wept and wept and it just was amazing and things were starting the church take it some of them are very scared but I think the I mean how they take him repenting of the oh. sins there was wailing conviction was com coming it was just all over the people were wailing and they welcomed him of course because we love him and he loves us and we know that but what exactly what he was fearful of was, was not happening he was fearful that they would reject him but we had not because he He's a changed man, and his preaching is different. He was anointed before, but he is way anointed now. I mean, way anointed. Oh, he's an amazing man. Anyway, my testimony is that I um, wanted to come so bad. My husband and I wanted to come, but we have a little girl that had surgery, and we have a lot of medical bills, and um, so we didn't, didn't have the money to come, and we prayed, and we prayed, and we fasted, and by the way, our church is like fasting and, and has prayer meet, meetings now that lots of people come to, and powerful things are happening, but revival's still going to come. <laughs> Anyway, um, I was praying for the, for the money, and the Lord just said, give it up. Just give it up. And I said, Lord, okay, then you meet me here in Omaha, or you find a way for us to, to go, and we'll go. And when I was at ground zero with it, I got a call from my music pastor. And be, the church sent my husband and I to come here. With, we're not pastors. On, we're not on staff. We're just lay people. But... He's, the Lord found a way for us to come. And I tell you, since I've been here, the power, this has never happened to me before like this. How long, how long have you been here? Since uh, Tuesday, we went to the worship conference. Oh, my Lord, there was power. Oh. <clears throat> so you've never done this before? No, no. <clears throat> I don't know how I'm going to lead worship now. <laughs> What is, what is this? What is this? The glory of the Lord. Oh, it's Jesus. Does that hurt or does it feel good? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what? When something like that happens to you there, you said, oh, is, what, what's that? Does it feel good? What is that? It's the release. It's just... 
it just comes over me and when I shout, it just has to, it's like I told somebody today, it's like a tea kettle. <laughs> when the power, when the heat's there, you got to release it. Oh! <laughs> I, I, I tell you the truth, I cannot, I, it's not me, it's Jesus. And I don't, you know what, I can't control it, but you know what, I don't want to. Because I just want more Je- Jesus, I just want more Jesus. When people that hadn't been touched like that would see you doing that, they'd think, oh my, I don't want anything like that. What would you say to them? I didn't either. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what about now? Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. I just want more. And if I'm on the ground the whole time, then I'm on the ground. I just want Jesus. Praise God. That's wonderful. God bless you. That's good. Amen. Hi, what's your name? My name's Tabitha Castile, and I'm from Brighton, Colorado. Colorado. Yeah. Well, what is your testimony? Um, I'm a preacher's kid, and my husband's also a deacon of the church. And I, I your husband's a deacon? Yeah. Well, yeah. And I came to Brownsville. What church are, are you? Is he a deacon? Assembly of God. Assembly of God. I came to Brownsville last November with my husband. And I came and I said, God, I've got to have something from you because I can't go back like I am. I was depressed. I was on medication. I had, God delivered me from sexual addiction and I hated with a passion my pastor's wife. And he set me free. I I, I would stand in line and I'd, I'd tell people, I have to have something from God. I have to have an answer. I can't go back like I am because I'll kill myself. And he's faithful. He is so faithful. He set me so free. Now, how long ago was that? November. That's November. This is July, so you've been free for. Free! Uh, I'm still free! <laughs> yeah. What about the heaviness and the darkness? No pressure? It's gone. I, I don't need medication no more. He's healed me of everything. I'm set free of all the problems and the, the Lord has a way of working how did it happen when you came how did it happen well I was standing down here and you came up and prayed for me and you said the ugly thing that comes up out of the water and torments you I drowned you in the name of Jesus <laughs> and I, I just I went down and I, I knew I was free I knew I was free because I just knew it wow and you're free I'm free. And you look free. I am free. Your face, your face is bright. I'm free. There's no darkness on you. I am free. And let me tell you about my pastor's wife. <laughs> she had cancer. And she had battled cancer for two years. And I thought, you know, this is God's judgment on her because she is so mean. <laughs> And I had a really bad attitude towards her. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> and I, we came here because we, we had to have an answer from God whether or not we were going to stay at the church. You know, I had battled with it and I battled with it. And I thought, Lord, I can't take it anymore. I got to go. But I'm going to go to Brownsville and get an answer from you. And he gave me the answer. And Father filtered. <laughs> I was there that Sunday. And... and, and the Lord worked it out that I was in charge of the meals delivered to the pastor and his wife the last six months of her life. And she passed away in May. And the Lord gave me such a love for her. I could not do enough to make up for what I had done. I could not do enough. If you have a problem with your pastor or your pastor's wife, you get on your face before God. They're God's people. Don't you dare touch them. Don't you dare lay a hand on them. Suppose, suppose there's somebody here in, on the campus in one of our buildings that's having a real problem with their pastor 
They're in rebellion against the church of the pastor or his wife. What would you say to them? Repent. No matter what. Repent. God put them in charge over you. There's no, that didn't happen by chance. God put you in that church. God taught me submission. He taught me how to humble myself before my pastor's wife. And I needed to learn that because I was too proud. And if you have a problem with your pastor's wife or your pastor, you need to repent because God put them there. It doesn't matter if they were wrong or right. God put you there under them and you need to repent if you have a problem with them or you leave. So the last six months when you went and served dinner to your pastor's wife, you had a chance to love on her and make everything right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. I thank God every day for that opportunity. So they put you in charge of serving the meals. Yep. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? Yep. <laughs> God bless you. It's wonderful. We love you. How come up? Hi. How you doing, man? How you doing? What's your name? Kevin Strickland. Kevin Strickland. Where are you from? Uh, Stockbridge, Georgia, just below Atlanta. Well, what's your testimony, man? <clears throat> well, uh, from the time I was about six years old, I was born and raised Pentecostal. And at the age of around 10, 12, around 10 and 12 years old, I got the rebellious spirit in me that if I didn't want to go to church, I didn't have to go to church. I didn't understand that it was defeating for me. And I rebelled against my parents and things like that. About seven, about the age of 17, uh, I joined a gang and I started dealing drugs and doing drugs and started drinking. And I was an alcoholic before I was 21. Uh, November 19th of 1994, I rededicated my life to Christ and He started dealing with me. So at the age of 19, I got out of the gang, or I got beat up to get out of the gang. Uh, what did they do to you? Well, to get in and to get out, I had to take being beat by who were supposedly going to be my friends and my family. They beat you to get in? And to get out. Was it bad? Yeah, it it hurt pretty bad. Um but I, even after I rededicated my life I backslid again and uh, I didn't join up with a gang or anything like that but I did start dealing drugs and things again I was addicted to the money more than the drugs and uh, I moved out of my house and moved in with my girlfriend to rebel against my parents I got three earrings and two body piercings because I knew that they wouldn't want it and they did, that's not what they thought was your parents are Christians? yes sir they they've mama's prayed for me from the day I was born she here? yes sir where you at mama? stand up bless you Well, seven months ago, God started dealing with me tremendously. And I got on my face before him in my home church in McDonough, Georgia. And I cried out to him. And I said, Lord, please, anything you want to do with my life, just do it. And he took me out of drugs and took me from drinking I was trying to keep my story straight before I fall down (laughs) Um. (laughs) why do you feel up here son? A tremendous anointing of God. Ever since I was six years old, I've been singing in church. God gifted me with a voice. And seven months ago, I realized that He wanted me to use my voice for His ministry and not my own. Well, I moved back in with my parents about seven months ago. 
I started going back to church and I felt that the hardest thing for me to give up was alcohol. Alcohol and cursing. I had a filthy mouth. Well, I was delivered from it. But still being a baby Christian, my friends were a big influence on me. So about a month ago, I ended up drinking again. And I fell under such conviction that I couldn't hardly get up. I didn't feel like doing anything but just praying and asking for forgiveness. Well, he's laid me straight now. And how all this ties into the revival is I've been here two or three times. And uh, coming here, God proved to me and showed me that it don't matter what you're in, it don't matter how far under you feel like you are, he can bring you up to a level that will surpass anything you could ever feel. And about seven months ago, seven months ago when he started dealing with me was the first time I ever received uh, the Holy Spirit by being slain in the Spirit and it felt like a jackhammer hitting me in the head. <laughs> but I will, I will claim till the day I die it was the greatest and best feeling I've ever felt in my entire life. It'd be any drug, any alcoholic high, anything I've ever had. I was, I, even though I was used to standing up in front of people and singing, I wasn't, I didn't feel that being in front of people and letting God work through me was a big positive in my life. But coming down here to this revival, God told me, I can hear him now. I hear him. He spoke to me and he told me that I've been called to ministry. I am, I am to be a minister of song. And it was because... I was willing to open myself up here and release and totally let go. I don't care what people think anymore. I don't care if you look at me anymore. I'm going to praise him because he gave me a body and a voice to praise him as long as I live. Listen. What, um, what's one of your favorite songs? My favorite song is uh, my my testimony is by Bob Carlisle, Living Waters. Sing a little bit of it, <clears throat> if I can. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, I got to remember some of it now. <laughs> You'll do good. I can tell you got a good voice while you talk. <clears throat> uh, so come, living waters. Flow through me like a river. My heart's been thirsting so long. Flood through my soul and pour out your mercy.
that's fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand and he's riding a white horse across this land and he's calling out to you and me will you ride with me will you ride with me and we say yes Lord a crown on his head he carries a scepter in his hand and he's leading the armies across this land and he's calling out to you and me will you ride with me will you ride with me we say yes Lord That fire in his eyes is his love for his bride, and he's longing that she be with him right by his side. That fire in his eyes is his burning desire that his bride be with him right by his side. And he's calling out to us right now, Will you ride with me? Say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everyone in the chapel, if you would, please stand. Everyone in the main auditorium, those of you at home, I want you to get out of your lazy boy, Bubba. Stand up. We're going to all pray the prayer that we've been praying since Father's Day, 1995. This is... We're in the middle of our third summer in revival. People have asked us how long this is going to go on. We don't know. We don't care. I, I came for three hours. <laughs> I 
that's really folks are asking the New York Times they said you know how long is this going to go on and you know they just they want to keep covering the revival and and uh, those of you that are familiar the New York Times put it in the front cover the front the front page of the New York Times and they just they were just inundated with phone calls from around the world people trying to get here trying to get to the revival after reading a, almost a full page on the revival and that's one of the things they asked. They said, how long is this going to go on? Friend, if you'll study church history, there were seasons where God came down and it lasted a few weeks. Other times it lasted a few days. Sometimes it lasted a few years. But I'm not caught up on how it, when it began or when it's going to end. I'm caught up right in it. And I, I don't want to miss a thing. So it makes no difference, Jesus. If it goes on for 10 years... Three more years, two years. I just want to be here. Just in the middle of what you're doing, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. I want everyone, I want everyone to pray the same prayer we've been praying since Father's Day. I want you to pray it out loud. This is for every God hater and every God lover here. Now, I know there are some people here you don't want to be here. You hate me. You you hate this church. The lights are too bright. You just, you don't like nothing about it. You don't want to be here. You think all those testimonies are fake. You just, people come all the time like that. Just, people come to mock. They come to make fun. There was a man that was sat right back in that section, came one night to watch his former homosexual lover get baptized. He was so mad, angry, that his lover had gotten saved at the Brownsville Revival. And he came out of anger to watch his former lover get baptized. And he sat back there seething in bitterness and anger because his former lover left him, quit homosexuality, and was going on with God. And so people come to these services for all kinds of reasons. But something happens here. And that man was sitting there, and I call it the conviction of the Holy Ghost. You can call it the heebie-jeebies. You can call it feeling weird. You can say, honey, I feel funny. You can call it anything you want, friend. It's the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost that night got a hold of that man. As he watched his former lover get baptized, he stayed for the rest of the song service, stayed through the preaching, and that's all he could handle, friend. He came running to the altar, gave his life to Jesus, and two weeks later... Two weeks later, two weeks later, he was in the baptismal pool getting baptized. Glory. So people come here for all different reasons. I want to welcome everyone and I want everyone to pray this prayer right now out loud. If you're a scholar, I want you to pray it. If you don't even know where Genesis is, I want you to pray it. Everyone out loud. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your In your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now I perceive in my spirit that... Um, there are some people here that I have a hard time with stuff like that. I just perceive that in my spirit. That uh, most, most folks here are going, hey, I can handle that. That's cool. You know, whatever, as long as it's on her and not on me. But, but let me tell you about manifestations, friends. Manifestations can come and go like the wind. It doesn't matter if you fall forward, fall backward fall on your face. It doesn't matter if you cry all night long. It doesn't matter if you feel the power of God or you don't feel the power of God. The bottom line is, is your life changed? That's what's going on. So don't get hung up. We don't get hung up on manifestations. This little booklet right here, when, when God first started moving mightily uh, before I came to Brownsville, 
And when I came to Brownsville, I just kept compiling. I have, I've got an extensive library. Mike Brown has got an extensive library. Pastor's got a great library. And I started going through my library. I've got thousands of books, and, and, and many of them, probably half of them, are either 100 or 200. Some of them are 300 years old. And so I can't move them around. They're very brittle. They're old leather books. But a lot of them are on revival. And I would read the old Methodist revival books from the 1790s and the 18, 1801. And I've got old, uh, an old, old Methodist magazines from the turn of the 1800s. And you open it up and you read stuff like this. The power came down. People were thrown to the ground. People were shaking violently. And I thought, well, that's cool. That's neat because they saw that too. And, and this is not, to me, reading this whole stuff does not say, well, then it's God because it happened back then. No. It was just interesting to see that history is repeating itself. I love this. Same Jesus. I believe John Wesley was a man of God. I don't know about you. I believe he had something going. He turned England around. There's a book out called England Before and After Wesley. Is there a book out America Before and After You? There is one about Wesley. So he had something going for him. He did something right somewhere. And he saw the power come down. People fell. And, and so I started compiling. And this, this is just a little booklet. It's, it's got a lot of old pictures of these guys and how saintly they looked back then with their cloaks and, and collars and their, their wigs. And um, Charles Finney, I remember turning in one of his little memoirs and and he talked about waves and waves of liquid love shooting through his body. He said it was like electricity zapping him. Shoo, 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 just shooting through his body. It was so important to Charles Finney that he wrote about it in his journal. And in detail of how these waves of liquid love just shot through his body. Now, Charles Finney is not known for the ministry of liquid love waves. <laughs> he is not known for, there's the man, that the waves of electricity shot through him. But let me tell you something. Part of that was the making of a man of God. God took him and shot him through with his power. And from that came one of the greatest evangelists that ever graced America. I said that to say this, friend. Go after personal experiences with God. Go after it. God, I want you to touch me. I want you to touch me. And Lord, it doesn't have to be like you touched him or her. I want you to touch me. I want to experience I don't want to hear about it. My little children are growing up in a revival. I'm glad that they don't have to hear about Azusa. I'm glad they don't have to hear about the great awakenings. They can live in one. They can experience it. Man, that felt good to say that. But go after God. And I'm not talking about emotional experience. I'm talking about go after God. Let him touch you. And if he chooses... To move through you in a way that you might have seen tonight, it's wonderful. But if you stand there and you don't feel a thing, that's wonderful too. Because you're open. You're saying, Jesus, all the stops are out. I'm letting you do whatever you want to me, Jesus. And if you don't feel his presence, and for those of you that... There's some critics tonight when the young man stood here and, and he said, it was the greatest feeling... And he said, when the Holy Spirit moved on me like that and I fell to the ground, and some of you Pentecostals were sitting here going, he didn't even speak in tongues. <laughs> Let me tell you something, friend. If you walked around with me in this place, people get filled with the Holy Ghost by surprise all the time. All the time. One lady called the church, a Baptist lady who's a teacher in a large Baptist church here, got so filled with the Holy Ghost so filled, she called the church and asked the church, what was this coming out of her mouth? <laughs> but I want to tell you, 
I believe in the initial evidence. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I believe in tongues. But we have placed such an emphasis on that little, it's almost a theatrical thing, you know. He's got it. He's finally prayed through. You see, I've, I've lived for 22 years as, as a Christian. And I, that's not a long time. It's long enough to see a lot of those folks that get it not change. No change. But they, they, they got it. Friend, I've had it with religion. I've had it with religion. I believe. I believe in the fullness of the Spirit. But I'm saying, Jesus, however you want to move in these last days, fill them with your Holy Ghost. Slam them. Slap them silly. Whatever you want to do, Jesus, it's A-OK -okay with us. Just change our lives. Get a hold of us. Change us. Turn us around. Turn us around. Glory. Turn with me to Psalm 32. This is entitled, matter of fact, just leave a space, note taker, for the title, because I'm not going to tell you the title yet. But I do have a title. Sometimes I don't have titles because it's God's grace that I get a message, much less a title. See, I came to this revival with five sermons. I was traveling evangelists. We have five good sermons, and that's it. <laughs> The revival goes longer than five sermons. You're in trouble. <laughs> so we have to get up every morning and the Lord puts a message on my heart. And I get up, I don't know what you do, but I get up around 6 a.m. after we get about four hours sleep. I'll get up in the morning and I know in a few hours I'll be standing in front of thousands of people again with another message. And I'm saying, Jesus, here's the way it is, Lord. I don't care if I don't have a title. I'll call it Saturday night's message. <laughs> Give me anything, Jesus. Any word. Just a thought. Whatever you want to say, Jesus. Psalm 32. But we're fortunate tonight. We will have a title. Psalm 32. We're going to read this psalm. It's short and sweet. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is a man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Those of you in this room that are just et up with sin, David had been there. Sin will kill you. It'll destroy you. It'll keep you from sleeping at night. It'll wake you up in the middle of the night, trembling, sweating, why? Guilt, paranoia, it's called sin. For day and night, verse 4, thy hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledge my sin to thee and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. Verse 6, therefore let everyone who is godly pray to thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not reach him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou dost preserve me from trouble. Thou dost surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Verse 9. Do not be as a horse or as a mule which have no understanding whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise they will not come near to you. Many are. That just seems strange that right. Just right in the middle of this psalm. Verse 10, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord, verse 11, and rejoice, ye righteous ones, and shout for joy. It's in there. And shout for joy for all, all you who are upright in heart. Verse 9, do not be as a horse or as a mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Now turn with me to Proverbs 26. Just a couple of scriptures here. Proverbs 26. That's the next set of books in the Bible there, friend. 
Just a few more pages to your right. Proverbs 26, verse 3. A whip is for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. This is Bible. Now turn with me to one more set of scriptures, and we could go to a bunch of them, but this is probably my favorite portion in the Bible concerning a powerful, powerful testimony, and I refer to it a lot, Acts chapter 9. We're going somewhere, friends, and it's not going to take us long to get there. Remember, be not as a horse or the mule. Acts chapter 9, 1 through 10. And Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. That's strange. And he fell to the ground. That's strange too. He bit the dust. And heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now this story goes on and I'm not going to read the rest of it but many of you know that Saul was prayed for and something like scales fell from his eyes. Those of you that have a hard time with manifestations would have a serious hard time with Saul of Tarsus because this guy, everything we've seen in this revival, although we have seen some phenomenal stuff this story dwarfs everything we've seen. A bright light at noonday, brighter than the sun. A voice coming out of the heavens, talking to that voice from the dirt, lying in the dirt. Then being blinded for three days, and on the third day, something like scales falling from your eyes. That's heavy. Maybe, just maybe, if you make it to heaven with your critical manifestation hang up. Maybe God will put you at the marriage supper of the Lamb right across from Saul who became Paul of Tarsus. And he'll say, how you doing? And you go, I'm fine. And he'll say, I perceive in my spirit that something's troubling you. And you'll say, well, I just thank God it's over. It's good to be at the marriage supper. I just want to tell you, I don't know who you are, but I just want to tell you, I was so sick of that revival in America. I was so sick of all that shaking and all those people falling everywhere. I was so sick of people falling to the ground. Think about that. You're talking to Paul, okay? And he goes, are you talking about the Brownsville revival? <laughs> We know all about that. We watched it from the large screen up here. <laughs> and Paul's going to turn to you and go, did you have a problem with that? <laughs> He's going to go, lady, let me tell you a story. Would to God that it was just my hand that shook. But no, it wasn't my hand. My whole body went down. I bit the dust. I ate dirt, woman. Midday. And that was bad. That was embarrassing because I was a leader. And I was in the dust. But not only that, a voice shone out from the heavens through this bright light and spoke directly to me. 
And I answered that voice back. And then everything grew dark. And I was blinded. And here I was, a man of means, a man well-respected, a man with a mission, being led around blinded. For three days, lady, I was blinded. And then a man prayed for me. I had already felt my eyes and something crusty had formed over the top of them. It was weird because I've known fishermen and it felt like fish scales. But I rubbed them and it wouldn't go away. Then somebody prayed for me. And those crusty scales fell from my eyes, rolled off my chest, and fell on the floor. And you got a problem with this? <laughs> Lady? Well, maybe you'll sit across from Philip, who is translated. And you'll say, Philip will look at you and say, hey, what's your name? Bob. A lot of Bobs come to this revival. <laughs> Bob, you don't look too happy. Well, I'm just glad I finally made it up here. I was so sick and tired of all that stuff. What are you talking about, Bob? Well, you know, everybody laying hands on everybody and folks flying through the air. I want to tell you something, Philip. I saw a man... In, in Pensacola, he flew through the air three feet. Three feet through the air and hit the wall, fell down to the ground and repented and threw the, through the air three feet. And Philip's going, three feet? Whoa. That's cool. Three feet. Boy, you really saw something. He'll say, let me tell you something, Bubba. When I finished my missionary task with the Ethiopian eunuch, I had to be somewhere quickly. So the Lord, I flew 25 miles, just like that. Woo. Whoo. I don't know what it's going to be like on that day, but I got a feeling God's going to sort of mix us all up like that. You know? William Seymour, the great one-eyed black man that led the Azusa Street Revival, powerful man of God. And G. Campbell Morgan, the man who came against him and said it was the last vomit of Satan. G. Campbell Morgan is a wonderful scholar. I love his books, but he missed God. You can be smart, Bubba, and miss God. You can miss God. G. Campbell Morgan came publicly against Azusa Street and said it's the last vomit of Satan. I got a feeling at the marriage supper, William Seymour will be sitting across from G. Campbell Morgan just to chat. And everything will be made known then, by the way. G. Campbell Morgan will look at William C. Murangor. He'll go, man, what a fool I was. What a fool I was. That revival that broke out in that shack by the year 2000 there was 800 million Pentecostals. By the way, that's about the figure. From 700 to 800 million Pentecostals in the world. And most of them can trace their heritage back to old Willie Seymour and his little milk crate pulpit in California. Mm. Watch what you say, friend. Well... Some of you in this room are stubborn. I just heard a lady say, they're talking about you, honey. <laughs> There's women in this room going, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But you know what's funny? Your husband's doing the same thing. He's going, thank you, Lord. You're stubborn. That means you're obstinate. You're unyielding. You're bullheaded. You're cantankerous. You're hard-headed, headstrong. Does this fit anybody in this room? Have you ever been absolutely, positively, without a shadow of a doubt, sure that you were right and you were dead wrong? 
If you don't believe you've been like that, friend, you need to go in your closet and look at some of them clothes you bought. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> You're still making payments on that dress. And you wore that thing one time and will never wear it again. But boy, you're absolutely positively sure that that was the gown, that was the dress. We can be stubborn, we can be pig-headed, rebellious, self-willed, set in our own ways, stiff-necked. I heard a preacher one time preach on stiff-necked people, but he couldn't get that out. He kept calling them stiff-naked people. He said, they're just a bunch of stiff-naked people. It's stiff-necked. Stiff-necked. Unbending, that means, friend, you are stiff-necked. You're one way and one way only. You are so stubborn. You won't turn and give anybody the time of day. You are set in your own ways. Stay with me, friend. This is Bible. Those of you listening from the Internet, welcome. <laughs> Unbending, people listen to these messages all around the world, friend. It's amazing. I love the technology today. That little note that, you read, that pastor read a few minutes ago. People are, are listening to tonight's service. They will listen in a couple days in New Zealand. They'll listen to it in Zimbabwe. Somebody out in a hut in the middle of nowhere will be listening to the Brownsville Revival. Friend, it's awesome, the world we live in. I love the technology today. But you're unmanageable, hut person. You're unreasonable. You're a bummer to live with. <laughs> Some of you, the Holy Ghost has been trying to work on you. Get a message through that skull of yours. Change your life. But you are so hard to get through to. These altar calls amaze me. We'll give an altar call and hundreds will flood the altar. And then for 20 minutes, people trickle. Sometimes 50 trickle, and then 20 more trickle. We've had, we've had three and 400 trickle. There's been a times where this was full down here, and I wanted to just stop the altar call, and the Lord said, no, there's a lot of stubborn people out there, Steve. So I'll say, Charity, sing it again, or Lyndall, sing, and we'll give the altar call again, keep calling the people, and they'll start flooding from all over, and then they'll fill the aisles, spread out through the sides. It's incredible, friend, how stubborn some of us in this room can be. He's been trying to get your attention through all kinds of things. Everyone, listen. Do not be as a horse or the mule that has to be beaten into shape or whipped into shape or put a, a, a bridle and a bit in their mouth. Why? Just to get them to do the right thing. Friend, the Lord's warning you right now. He's tried to get your attention through preachers or pastors or lay leaders. Maybe he's tried to get your attention through trials and tribulations. Quit cursing everything bad that comes your way. A difficult day could be one of the best things you ever had come to you. It wakes you up, friend. I remember when my wife and I were engaged, we were so in love, we were infatuated with one another. And we were at Dave Wilkerson School in Texas. And Gwen Wilkerson, who used to cut our hair at the school, Dave's wife, she went up to me one day and she said, Steve, look at me. She said, I know you're in love with Jerry, but you may be missing God. She may not be the girl for you. And coming from her, Gwen Wilkerson, it could have come from anybody but Gwen. Because she was like a prophetess to me. And it just, it caused me to reevaluate everything, get my feet on the ground, and really test it to see if it was God. Because I was fixing to marry a girl that I'll be with for the rest of my life. Think about it, friend, before you tie that knot. It ain't for six weeks. It's for the rest of your life. And turns out it was God. And we've been married for 18 years. We're in love with each other. Have a wonderful family. But someone else might have taken that, that a critical word from Gwen Wilkerson like that or a hard word and it just, they blow up in her face. Who do you think you are saying something like that to me? I'm in love. A lot of times you're in lust. Don't be stubborn. 
Maybe God's been trying to get to you from some, some, from some counsel or maybe some trials and tribulations. Maybe he's been trying to, to get a hold of you and soften your heart. But instead of softening your heart, it's become even harder. Well, a few points tonight that I'm sure the Lord's going to try to get across. Number one is this. Jesus wants to talk to you. Look at me, everybody. Jesus wants to talk to you. How many would agree with me he wanted to talk to Saul of Tarsus? I believe he did. But see, Saul was not the kind of guy you'd give a track to. You know? You couldn't ride up to the side of his mule, friend, and, 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 and say, hey, listen, here's the newest chick track. This was your life. You know? He wasn't about to receive it. He'd say, off with your head, boy. Jesus wants to talk to you. This much I can ascertain from the story of Saul. He wants to talk to you. For years, as a drug addict, Jesus was trying to talk to me. He was trying to get my attention. Listen up, everybody. God has been trying to get your attention through preaching. Some of you go home and you turn the television on, and there's John Hagee screaming at you. He's trying, he's saying, he's saying, give him praise and glory. And you hear that, and you go, oh my God, man. And you flip on CNN or something. Maybe God wants to talk to you. He's been trying to get your attention. Maybe you go into the men's room at work, and somebody's put a gospel track right there. And you can't stand those religious zealots that put tracks all over the place. Why don't you read it, friend? Maybe God's trying to talk to you. Maybe God's trying to lead you to a close relationship with him. Jesus wants to talk to everyone here. Every one of you in the chapel, Jesus wants to talk to you. Those of you that are at home, some of you are stubborn as mules. God wants to talk to you. He wants to speak into your life. But some of us are so hard, so hard. Sometimes he'll speak to us through our wives. I believe that's Carrie Robertson's story. Is that correct? Did not your wife, was her, was her relationship with the Lord what caused you to come to Jesus? A relationship with Jesus, his wife, was so godly that it drew him to the side of Christ. Isn't that awesome? God may be having, may, there may be a friend that next to you. We have kids that are here tonight that, are, that, have been, that have come off of drugs. They're on fire for God. And how did it happen? They met somebody who got saved at the revival. And they saw their face and were so jealous of the change in their lives. They started talking to him and found out that it was Christ in them that had transformed their life. God wants to talk to you. You with me? Then let's get into the meat of it. In order for God to speak to you, he's first got to get your attention. He's got to get your attention. And here's the most difficult part, friend. Getting your attention. Some of you are the pits to talk to. Why? You're on the moon. You're in la-la land, friend. Try to talk to you. You won't look at us in the eyes. You won't pay attention. You heard this testimony tonight of this little girl who slaps her mother around, who slapped her mother around. Could you imagine what it was like living in her house? Your daughter comes home, 14-year-old know-it-all. You know? Your 14-year-old daughter should come home and do the dishes. She should come home and help clean the house, wash her own clothes, iron her own clothes. But she comes home and she's just a, a little witch. She slaps you around and you cook a meal and you don't like the food. She doesn't like the food, so she cusses you out that you didn't cook. Mama, many of you mamas have gone through that. Your kids don't appreciate you. Young people, I want every teenager to listen to me that woman called your mama you may not remember this but there was a time where when you cried at two o'clock in the morning and she was exhausted she got up from her bed went into your room got you out of that crib undid her pajamas and put you up to her breast and gave you milk for an hour and patted you on the back to make sure you burped because she wanted to make sure you didn't choke on that milk. 
and you burped and you spit up a little bit of it. And she wiped that up and then you started crying again. You wanted a little bit more. Mama was tired. She's only had two hours sleep in three days. Why? Because of you. You. But you know what she did? She just stayed in there, fed you a little bit more, burped again, threw up some more. Then what'd you do? You filled your britches. She's not only tired, now it stinks in the room. <laughs> now she's got to change them. So she changes your britches. You don't remember this, do you? You don't remember a thing. I'm telling you, it happened. She fixes you all up. Lays you back down. An hour later, <laughs> I've been there, friend, I've heard that. What is it now? Something dumb? Something stupid? You're sleeping with your elbow in your eye? And you ain't got enough sense to get your elbow out of your eye, so... Here she comes again. She just got in a 15-minute cat nap. Now she's got two hours and 15 minutes and three days of sleep. She goes in there, gets your el elbow out of your eye. Now you can't sleep. Now you can't sleep. But boy, she went through all of that, friend. Nursed you, took care of you. Now you're 13. Now you're somebody. You're a know-it-all. Friend, young person, back off. Boy, back off. Love your father and your mother. Respect your father and your mother. Take care of your father and your mother. That's not in my notes, but that was timely for somebody in this room. In order for God to speak to you, he must first get your attention. Now, some of us in this room don't need much coaxing when it comes to the voice of the Lord and obedience. Tonight, many of you are going to come forward and you're going to get your heart right with God because you have sin in your life. You're backslidden. And the Lord's going to speak to your heart and he's going to do like this. When I mention things like pornography, you can sit and watch a movie and watch a woman take her blouse off in that movie, sir, and it doesn't grieve you. You're backslidden, friend. Period. You're in sin. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do, and he sure wouldn't do that. Ma'am, you, you read a fantasy novel, and you read about someone else's love affair in there. You become one of those characters, but you're a good godly Christian. You go to church on Sunday morning, sing in the choir. Friend, you're in sin. Jesus would never be reading that trash. Sir, you come home from work, and you might be an all right person at work, but when you come home, you're a bear to live with. You come in and scream at the kids. You scream at your wife. You say, where's my food? This is cold. I want to tell you something, friend. Jesus would never do that. You're in sin. That is not the fruit of the Spirit. You're a bear to live with. And some of you, as I'm saying this, I can see your heads. Many of you, your head's already dropped when you're looking at me. And God's already convicted you. And in a few minutes, you're going to come down here and God's going to deal with your heart. But others in this room are more difficult to deal with you're like Saul of Tarsus. God's got ahead a hold of you in another way. Maybe it's a car accident. I won't preach a funeral, by the way, unless I can give altar calls. Because funerals, people come to it that need to hear the gospel. And oftentimes a car accident is how God gets a hold of everybody. There's a corpse. That was walking and talking three days ago. Everybody saw her. Everybody loved her. She was just leaving the prom and was hit by a drunk driver. And maybe that's the very thing right there that's going to get a hold of some of the family. They're going to wake up and, and teenagers, friends are going to look at that girl in that casket and go 18 years old and she's gone. And then the preacher stands up and speaks about eternity. What are you doing with your life? Where are you going with your life? That is, that, is a, that is an extreme measure of God, and he uses those things all the time. 
Some of you are like that, friend. I'm telling you tonight, the Lord wants to speak to you, but he first has to get your attention. How many know what I'm talking about? Some of you might have a mild confrontation like Lydia in the Bible. You can read there later in Acts chapter 16 where Lydia was just listening to the preaching of Paul and she became a believer. People are like that in this revival all the time. They just listen, they go, wow. One girl got saved, was sitting in the back. She testified in the baptismal pool that she just came and she said, I was a good person. I mean, when the preacher was preaching against sin, I just didn't have anything in my life. I was a good person. But as I listened to the message, I realized I didn't know him. I didn't know Jesus. That was like Lydia. She just believed. She was a seller of purple cloth. And she just believed. No dramatic conversion. No nothing. She just became a believer. Read it for yourself in the book of Acts. Chapter 16. Other people come to God through curiosity like Nicodemus. Remember his story in John chapter 3. Curiosity got him. He had to come to Jesus that way. But others of you in this place, God's got to get a hold of you in a different way. I want you to bring me that, that bit and that bridle. Just the bit. This is a Saturday night illustration. This right here, friend, those of you that ride horses, we have a couple horses. And I will never use anything like this on my quarter horses. I've got two wonderful quarter horses. You can call them in the morning. I can wake up and go, they can be across the field and they just come walking over. They're wonderful, wonderful horses. But this right here is for the non-wonderful horses. This is for some of you that you don't come when God says, no, you're stubborn. <laughs> you're a mule. You want to fulfill scripture. <laughs> this right here is called the Lynn McKenzie gag and hack bit. Lynn McKenzie is a world renowned barrel racer. And that's quarter horses. It's spinning around those barrels. A lot of work. My, my, my younger sister was a rodeo queen of Alabama. She's a fabulous rider. She was a barrel racer. And, and uh, she would talk to me about some of the harder bits for more of the stubborn animals. She hated to use hard bits. But Lynn McKenzie came up with a bit that some of y'all, God's had to use on you. Puts a chain, puts his metal thing in your mouth right here. This over the top of your nose and this chain underneath your jaw. Once this thing is on the horse, he's dead meat. You pull this thing back, the first thing that happens is it cuts off his oxygen supply. <laughs> he can't breathe. Pull it back a little bit more, it breaks the cartilage in his nose. I was talking to a trainer today and he said, I would never. He said, I can't believe they allowed that bit. But it's a real bit, the Lynn McKenzie gag and hack bit. And some of you are in this room. This is what the Lord, there's that fly from last night. <laughs> Put this bit on that fly. <laughs> fly, I'm going to tell your brother. I told him last night. There's thousands of people here. Take your pick. Get off the preacher. <laughs> but some of you, this is what God has got to do. He's got to pull in, he's got to reach into his tackle box and find something, his tack room, and find something that'll work on you. This is pitiful, friend. This is pitiful. He deals with you about sin. He wants to talk to you, and he's got to pull this thing out. Why? Because you're so stubborn. You wait to the end of the altar call to come forward. God speaks to you about pornography and you keep wavering with it. He speaks to you about lust and you keep wavering with it. Some of you, you'll come to an altar call and you'll repent of, of, of lust and pornography. Then you'll go to Walmart and you'll sit there and stare at the Cosmopolitan magazine cover. Or you'll come to a church service and girls will be dancing around and you'll be looking at the women dancing up and down, lusting over them. Dear God, friend. What has the Lord got to do to get your attention? Gouge your eyes out? What's he got to do to stop you? Some of you are shocked that I said that. 
I want to tell you something, friend. I've been here for 22 years. That's not a long time, but I've seen some stuff. I've seen some stuff. See, God's concerned about your spirit, man. Jesus said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Some of you are so stubborn. God wants your attention. And he'll go to extreme measures to get a hold of you. Now, I got a feeling, friend. I know what he used on Saul of Tarsus. And I'm going to pull this out because some of you need this. You'll never forget it as long as you live. I was in an antique shop the other day and I saw this in that antique shop and I was shocked. I'd never seen anything so massive. And I asked the man, I said, what is that? He said, that is called the commander. Charlie, I want you to bring this to me. And I said to him, I said, that is the biggest hammer I've ever seen in my born days. He said, pick it up, buddy. And I picked it up. I said, that is heavy. And I said, it's called the commander. I said, what's it called the commander for? He said, whatever it hits goes in. <laughs> and he said, that, that hammer is from the Barnum and Bailey Circus. They use that to drive the stakes in for the tents. He said, friend, when that thing hit the peg, the stake went all the way in, man. And if it didn't go all the way in, they hit it again. For long, the commander got the job done. I hope someone in this place is beginning to understand what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> if you don't... <laughs> But some of us in this room, see, Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, wasn't going to accept just a little track. He wasn't going to accept somebody walking up to him and talking to him about Jesus. What he needed was something upside the head. I don't know how you translate this thing, friend, but in the Word, there's some times where God gets our attention and he gets it good. You remember the, the jailer, Paul and Silas? Remember that story? God looked down at that jailer and he said, I think an earthquake will do. I'll just shake him silly. God looked over his resources, looked through his warehouse, and he said, I think I'll just pull the earthquake lever and shake that jailer silly. I think I'll just get him saved quick, Warren. Get him saved quick. No questions. Just what must I do to be saved type of thing. You know? That's what this is. And I want to tell you, in these last days, God's pulling this thing out, friend. He's pulling it out. He pulled it out on Saul of Tarsus. He said, boy, oh, apple. Down he went. Ah, what do you want me to do, Lord? Oh, my head. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, man. The title is called The Commander tonight. <laughs> Don't be like the horse or the mule. Don't be like the fool that has to have those stripes across his back. Don't be like someone that God has got to go to extreme measures to get your attention. When on earth, friend, are you going to be pliable and sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Do you have to be like Balaam and have a donkey talk in English to you before you'll finally get the message? Jesus loves you, has a plan for your life. Won't you come? God's been dealing with some of you about the ministry. I want you in my ministry. I want you in my ministry. I will, Lord, next year. I will. You've been next year in the Lord for 15 years. When I have a little money, when, I have, when you have a little money, you spend a little money. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? 
I'm going to say this. This is going to irritate somebody out there, but this is what the devil does. And you call it God. The devil will come up to you and bless you. Here's how you'll do it. You'll buy a car. You'll fix it up and you'll put it out in your front yard. you got a call to the ministry. you got a call to the ministry. You're going to Bible school in just a few months. And you buy this car and you're going to use the money to pay for your Bible school. And you sell it and Lord have mercy, you make $850 profit. Well, you take the money down, you go to the Alabama auction and you buy a, another car. You put it out front and with a little mechanical work and you polish that thing up till it's brand new shiny, you make $3,000 on that thing. And in two weeks, you've made $3,850 profit. You go up to the auction, you buy two cars. You fix them both up, you polish them, you fine-tune the engine, you take them down for a $12 oil change. You put a few new hubcaps on them, you put them out in your front yard. Before you know it, you've made $8,000 profit. You're supposed to be in Bible school in three weeks. But things have changed. This is awesome. So you go do it again and again and again. Now you got the whole corner lot. Why? Because you got the money, you bought it. You bought the whole corner lot. One of the finest intersections in town. You got a call to the ministry, Bubba. But now you're making money. And all this time, you know who you gave the credit to? Jesus. Jesus is blessing me. Jesus is blessing me. Friend, I don't think so. I would be careful to give Jesus all the credit for that. Maybe the devil's pushing them automobiles in front of you, saying, come on, come on, come on. I'll give you everything. I promised it to Jesus, and he turned me down, but I'm going to give it to you. You can have it all. Bible school next year, wealth this year. Well, when this year rolls around, next year rolls around, you've got a car lot, and you're thinking about opening them one up in, the neighborhood in a neighboring town. Now you're into real estate. Fixing up houses. Before you know it, you have a half a million dollars of equity in the bank. Bible school doesn't look like it did before. Why live in poverty? Well, you can live in a $400,000 home and a nice couple new cars. This is silly. I'll just serve God by giving. I'll just give. But you know something else? You never seem to do that either. You never seem to give either. You give, yeah, you, you give. $200 in a missions offering or something like that. But that's what the poor man across the aisle from you gave. You gave 200 bucks. What's happened, friend? You've lost God in your life. But listen, one day something happens. The government comes down on you. You haven't been paying the taxes. You've blown it financially. And now... Your whole world is crashing down on you. They're going to take every one of your cars away from you. They're going to liquidate everything. You have to file for bankruptcy. I call it the commander. You call it the devil. You come to church and say, Pastor, pray for me. The devil's destroying everything I've gotten. And the Lord's going, Pastor, don't pray for him. This is an answer to years of somebody else's prayers. You're bankrupt. It's all over. You're squalling and bawling at the altar. And then this still, small voice comes back into your spirit and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon you, for I have anointed you to preach the gospel. How many know what I'm talking about? It happens every day all over the world. Once the Lord has your attention, and I'm going to close in just a minute, He is certain of what he wants to say to you. His message is clear tonight. The Lord knows exactly where you're heading. If you're in sin tonight, he knows where you're heading. Bring me out that halter, and I want to close with this illustration. For those of you that know nothing about horses, this is a halter, and I know very little, but I know enough to ride them, and I know enough not to stand behind them. And poke him and say, good little horsey, good little horsey. <laughs> but this is a halter. 
My favorite kind of horses are horses that you can slip one of these things on, just slip it over their head, hop on the back of them bareback, and just neck rein them. Neck reining is you just tap them on the right, they go left. Tap them on the left, they go right. Just neck reining. Those are the kind of horses we have. Wonderful horses. They come. This is the kind of Christian you're supposed to be. This is the kind of person you're supposed to be. You need to be a trigger. Remember Will Rogers' trigger? Just call him and he comes. You need to be Lassie. <laughs> what a dog. <laughs> what is it, Lassie? Ruff, ruff, ruff. <laughs> really? How long ago? Ruff, ruff, ruff. Which way? Ruff, ruff. What a show. I promise you now, there's people that have bought this tape. They've already bought the tape. This is what they were waiting for. They're sitting here tonight. They're sitting here tonight, and they're just waiting. The, the, the sermon was fine, you know. They go, man, there's, this was solid. They hate that when it's solid. You know, this is good. This is biblical, a lot of scripture. It's solid. And then they're waiting for something. And just then, yeah, they bought that, when that girl flipped over on the platform. Oh, that's good, gymnastics, yeah. <laughs> but boy, the icing on the cake was just then when the, the evangelist went, ruff, ruff, ruff. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I knew it. I knew it, they're barking like dogs at Brownsville. <laughs> Woo trust me. Trust me, friend. I mean, trust me. It will be played all over America. Just that one little segment. That's all they'll play. I had a pastor call me one day. He said, Steve, do you have any idea what is going on in my city, what they're doing with the Brownsville Revival? I said, yes. I said, it's hilarious. It is hilarious because Jesus Christ knows the truth. And I said, something else I told the pastor. People out there aren't stupid. They aren't stupid. They know that nothing's going to go on this long. That's why the media keeps pouring through here. They know people aren't going to come all over the world. So they know when a little segment is played on a radio program, a little out-of-context statement, people are getting smarter and smarter. And it's making the people on the radio programs look dumber and dumber. And people are going, now wait a minute. And then you want to know what they can do? They can turn it up. They can get this whole message and watch it on Internet. And they'll watch it on the World Wide Web. And then they'll call that radio program and go, wait a minute. Would you like someone to do that to you? take a conversation you had out of context? Whew. My, my. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Well, everyone stand. Everyone stand. Those of you with chairs, move to the left and the right. As quietly as you can, if you're thinking about slipping out, and going to the bathroom, we have speakers in the bathroom, sir. <laughs> the commander wants to get a hold of you tonight. He is the commander. He is over everything. He's trying to get your attention. For those of you that don't know him, he's a lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He is the one 2,000 years ago, I want everyone to listen, who was beaten, who was stripped, spat upon, cursed, ridiculed, bloodied, a plow was raked across his back. His flesh was split open. Guts 
muscle, veins were ripped out of his body. They crammed a crown on his forehead. Blood dripped down his face. Some of you prick your finger on a thorn. And you can't believe the pain. Have you ever noticed that? Just one little prick, the pain that that thorn could cause. Could you imagine the crown pressed on your forehead, piercing through the skin up to the skull and scraping the bone of the skull? That crown pressed on the forehead. And then, who slapped you, Jesus? Ridiculing him, he knew who slapped him. He knew everything. Then they place a beam on his back, drive him up Calvary's road, lay him on a cross, slam nails through his hand, through his feet, strip his garments off, the Bible says. He had garments. Scholars will tell you, most scholars agree that he was totally naked when they finally put him on the tree. That means totally naked. Humiliated. See, he covered that for you, friend. Humiliation. If you've ever been humiliated, how about hanging on a cross, naked, in front of all your followers, in front of all the women who worshipped you, now you're hanging up there naked. He covered every pain you could ever go through. Every pain, every suffering you could ever go through, he covered it. And there he was, bleeding, wounded, dying, suffering for you. I'm telling you, Jesus wants to talk to you tonight. And he looked out from there and he saw July 5th, 1997, and he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Did you notice this little girl's story tonight? She, you hear what she said? She said, I didn't know what I was doing. She was fulfilling scripture when she said that. That was a just ditto that we're out there in sin. She had no idea how, how she was driving the nails deeper in the Lord's hands. She had no idea how she was hurting her mother. She had no idea how bad, how many times she had violated Holy Scripture. And as a result of finding out about it, she repents and starts living for God. That should be the result of finding out about where you're at with God, friend. Tonight, for those of you that have never known the Lord, I'm telling you, He's here to come into your life, to make you brand new, to forgive you, to cleanse you. He's here. You don't have to understand everything about Jesus. And dear God, everyone listen, please don't be one of those that has to find him in the emergency room. I'm tired of those calls. It's funny, on the deathbed, no one wants to talk about finances. Nobody wants to talk about Wall Street. Nobody wants to talk about the social class. They want to talk about God. That's why they call the preacher. It's amazing, friend, what it takes for some of us for God to get our attention. That's so sad. You should be one, friend, tonight where the Lord can just speak to you and you come running. He speaks to you. He wants to talk to you, sinner. He wants to forgive you. He is the friend of sinners. Don't ever forget that. He loves you, friend. He died for you. Buddha didn't die for you. The psychics are not dying for you. They're dying for your money, but they're not dying for you. Jesus died for you. It's time you do something for him. I'm going to give this altar call in just a minute. Everyone in this room that's backslidden, if there's ever a time that you need to get right with God, friend, it's after this message. Don't be like a mule. Does God have to cram a gag and hack bit in your face? And I'm half convinced God's fed up with that anyhow. Tired of it. Obstinate, stubborn people. I just keep falling back into sin, falling back into sin. Falling. One of these days you're going to fall back into sin, friend, and he ain't going to be there. The Bible says his spirit will not always contend with man. I promise you there's claw marks on the side of the ark where people that would expect, were expecting God to give them one more chance, scrape their fingernails off trying to get into the ark. 
If they could stand here before you tonight, they would say the scripture that's in the word. The spirit of the Lord will not always contend with you. He will not always wrestle with you. Don't expect him to always be there every time you have a little problem. He expects you, friend, to live for him. Sinners, every time they go through a fix, jailhouse salvation, help me, Jesus, get me out of this fix, and I'll serve you. They get out and blow it again. Friend, it's time to stop that nonsense. Those of you that are backslidden, you're watching pornography, you're doing things Jesus, Jesus would never do, you're going to come quickly at this altar call. And those of you that are religious, Charity's going to sing, run to the mercy seat, religious person. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness. Religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity is getting on the cross. Religion is singing in the choir. Religion, and I, I believe in singing in the choir. Religion is taking communion. But I want to tell you, you can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. You can go to hell with baptismal waters all over your face. You can go to hell and be the head deacon at Brownsville Assembly of God if you don't know Jesus. Don't be a religious person. America is damned by religion. Tomorrow morning, all over America, we'll rise, go to church, and give God an hour. And half the people that do that will go home before the sun sets will be involved in some major sin. Whether it be drinking, adultery, pornography, but they already gave a little time to God, their little quick fix. That's religion, friend. It'll damn your soul. So tonight, I want to ask you this. Do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Is he everything to you, friend? If you're not consumed with the Lord, I question your salvation. See, there's a dividing line coming in the world right now, friend. And I, I predict by the year 2000, when someone says the name Christian, you will know exactly what that means. There will be a set-apart group of people. They'll be holy, righteous, God-lovers, sin-haters. When someone says, I'm a Christian, you will smell it. They'll be holy. But right now, everybody calls themselves Christians. No, friend. Either change your name or live up to it. So those of you that are religious in this place, but you don't know Jesus, I'm going to give you this altar call. You're going to come down here and meet him. Your membership card at the Methodist church won't save you. Your Baptist membership, your Assembly of God membership won't save you. You can go to hell with a certificate of ordination from the Assemblies of God hanging behind your desk. None of that will save you and you know it. The superintendent of the Assemblies of God, Thomas Trask, was just here last week. He loves this revival. We have a group of men that are, we're held accountable to, and he would stand here tonight, and he'll tell you, as a superintendent of the Assemblies of God, as a head man over this huge fellowship, I could go to hell. It doesn't matter what's hanging behind my desk. I could go to hell if my relationship with Jesus wasn't intact. So right now, friend, when this altar call is given, if there's sin in your life, if there's something between you and Jesus, if you've never known the Lord, you're going to come quickly. If there's ever a night for you to come quickly, it's tonight. Don't anyone come until charity begins to sing. If there's ever a night to come quickly, friend, it's right now. It's going to be tonight. Let the Lord just put that little halter on you and bring you down from that balcony, bring you down from the chapel cause you in your seat at home to get up and come down and get right with God. And for those of you that aren't going to do it, and you know there's sin in your life, that's called pride, friend. That's called pride. One of our workers come stand with this dear woman. That's called pride. Hurry, please. That's called pride. And pride, friend, is what casts Lucifer down. Look at me, everyone. Don't be distracted. Pride says, I wonder what my wife will think. 
I wonder what my husband will think. I wonder what my girlfriend will think. I wonder what my friends will think. You came into this world alone, friend. You're going to leave alone. What does it matter what your friend thinks? I don't, every time the Lord convicts me of something, I don't run to my wife, Jerry, to see if it's okay with her. It's up to me to deal with God. If God's dealing with you, you come. Do not hesitate. Right now, everyone who's away from God, everyone who has sin in their life, everyone who needs Jesus to forgive them, if you've never known him, I want you to come. If you're backslid, I want you to come right now. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Do not hesitate. Do not wait. Come on, come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. In the darkness. Hurry, hurry. Everything in the balcony, let's go. Come on. Come on, come on in the balcony, let's go. Come on, come on, come on. Hurry, hurry. I know of a place I could go. chapel come on in the chapel he said let's go come on come on in the chapel come on in the chapel come on come on in the chapel come on What are you waiting on? Come on. Put on the halter. Put on the halter. Put on the halter. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't be stubborn like a mule. Come on. God bless you. God bless you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless y'all. God bless you. Come on. Come on. I'm not so sure. I live and where hope has not been. Come on. Lost Come on. in the curse. Come on. Of a lifetime of sin. Come on. Hurry. Lovely Come on. They never come true. But I know where there's a place. Of mercy for you. He said that you can come and choose presence without fear. And to the holy place where mercy hovers near. Come a running, come a running, come a running to the mercy seat. Come on, Jesus. Come on. His calling. Come on. His grace will be our Hurry. You, sir. God bless you, man. Come on down. In the chapel, let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Keep crying out to God here at this altar. God's hearing you. Sir, the Lord told me to come and talk to you. I don't believe in two years of revival. I've spoken specifically like this to one person. But God has watched you. You have become so stubborn. 
so stiff-necked, so hard to deal with. But you want to know something that you feel? You feel nothing right now. You don't feel God. Why? The Bible says his spirit will no longer contend with man. There is a time when his spirit will leave. I believe someone has given you this tape or you're watching this broadcast because the Lord has given you one more chance. Sir, I'm telling you right now, you know the gospel. These people are crying for you. These people are weeping for you. These people are dying for you. They're moaning and groaning for your salvation. Get off of your chair. Get on your knees and say, Jesus, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Take this hard heart and make it a heart of flesh. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, make me new. Come on, friend. Come on. Come on. That's it. That's right. Come on. Come on. God bless you. No one at this altar move. Everyone stay where you're at. We're going to give you 30 more seconds and I'm going to close it. Just play softly. 30 seconds. 23. 20. Seventeen. God bless you, sir. Fourteen. Ten. Nine. God bless you. Eight. Seven. If you're coming, you better come now. Six. Five. In the chapel. Let's go. Three. Two. Sing this one time through. Sing it out loud. in the chapel. Those of you at home, I want you to bow your heads. Those of you listening on the internet, I want you to bow your heads right there. Bow your heads. You've fallen under conviction watching this. You've fallen under conviction listening to it. Now bow your head. Follow through. Follow through with the conviction. Conviction is there to change you. Everyone at this altar, everyone who's under conviction right now, pray with me. Dear Jesus, no, friend, I'm talking praying. Open your mouth. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to me. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking to my heart. I ask you tonight to forgive me. I have sinned. I have hurt you. I've hurt others. And I've hurt myself. I ask you, Jesus, right now to wash me, cleanse me, I repent of my sins. Wash my sins away. Make me new. Tonight, Jesus, be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. From this moment on, I am yours, and you are mine. I give myself 100% to you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory. Everyone at this altar, 
Everyone at this altar, I want you to stand. Just stand and face this way. Do not go back to your seats. Everyone in the chapel, those of you at home, I want you to listen. For those of you that are visiting for the first time and you may be wondering what's going on, we have never counted the numbers of people that came to the altar. If we did, it would be over 300,000 people that have come to these altars. The numbers you hear...